which leads to the next point. This is the last topic for the week. Uh, Alex Karp wrote a letter in the New York Times, an op-ed. Uh, I, I think we woke up to this Monday morning, and it's not it's not every day you wake up to your CEO doing an op-ed in, in the New York Times talking about how the progress of AI and the rapid speed of development is similar to our generation's Oppenheimer moment. For those that don't know the story of Oppenheimer, he was the person who essentially came up with the theoretical application of the first atomic bomb. bomb. And then he worked for a couple of years from 1942 to 1945 to actually build that bomb. And then Henry Truman uh, dropped that bomb on Japan, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And he, lev he led a life of a lot of guilt and mixed feelings because he felt he was responsible for killing about 100,000 people in, in a couple of seconds. So what did you feel? Let's start with uh, Steve. Did you get a chance to read the piece or any thoughts on on Karp's analysis philosophically about our Oppenheimer moment? No, I saw the highlights, obviously, from it. I didn't read it. I could care less about the, you know. So you didn't so, give a fuck. Okay, Matt. No, I could care less about foreign publications. But look, it's not what I read. I read CNBC, Wall Street Journal. I don't have time to read a regular newspaper. Okay, but, that's fair. That's fair. Um, look, think about why pa Alex Karp left Silicon Valley. Think about what he's continuously said time and time again. I mean, from what I know about the article, it just seems more what he has said for years and years. Okay. Matt, your thoughts on the article or at least the headline? I think, uh, you know, it's not any different than what Elon kind of says, you know, you, while it's something that is necessary uh, and it's the next progressive step within technology, just like, uh, I guess the, the change. And I think, sorry, let me take a 5,000 foot step back. The, I think what he's talking about is with respect to the military complexes of the world and how everyone is kind of being recognizing now. And I guess maybe it's maybe it's just new for us younger folks that didn't have to live through the Cold War, but how things truly changed from a military perspective once the atomic bomb was released. And I think the same thing is going to happen with AI, a lot of new developments, scientific developments that are funded by governments that are funded by militaries that are funded by a lot of these other things will have byproducts that I think we don't necessarily fully comprehend yet. And so having the, uh, the right safeguards in place and right treaties in place to make sure that this doesn't get out of hand very quickly is what I think that everybody is truly concerned about. I know Musk is concerned about it. I know many other folks are, are truly concerned about it. Some people aren't concerned about it at all thinking that it'll kind of regulate itself. And so I think that, you know, I, I didn't read too much into it. I skimmed through the article, but that's kind of the feel that I get is that, you know, this is the next step of progression and it's a, it's a natural step just based off of where we are, but with it will come side effects and, and complications from a geopolitical standpoint, from a military standpoint, from a technology standpoint, from a um, safety, security private privacy standpoint that I think will have a lot of side effects. Um, no, anyway. I, I agree with you. I, I think Carp really wanted to, to pen this article for the New York times. I think he loves this moment of being uh, potentially seen as one of the most influential CEO slash thought leaders slash philosophers of the next 10, 20 years. Right. Because to, 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 to say this is an Oppenheimer moment, Oppen remember, Oppenheimer ended up creating something that killed 200,000 people and led to the proliferation of nuclear weapons. I'm, 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 I'm simplifying it, but like that's kind of the gist of the whole point of why the movie, the book was created, all that stuff, right? That was one of the most important things in humanity that this guy was alive and he made this weapon or he made the, he came up with the physics to be able to develop this weapon. If Karp is saying this is our type of moment, he, and, 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 and given all the Ukraine stuff, he's starting to see how powerful it is. Uh, given the stuff he has said, I think he's really embracing the role. And and you know why I think he's embracing the role and he, why he likes this philosophy role? Because we've been talking about competitors to Palantir. There's this small company at 7 billion bucks called Scale AI. CEO is Alexander Wang. Alexander Wang, I did a video on him a while ago, gave a TED Talk last week. And in that TED Talk, the whole entire TED Talk was him walking on stage, he's like 26 years old, trying to sound like he's a thought leader around American democracy at the intersection of artificial intelligence uh, and underpinning the geopolitical crises we will have over the next decade. And the reason why he's doing this TED Talk is because he wants to sell the same type of Gotham-esque software to the government that Palantir is selling. And so it's obviously a very effective sales and marketing tactic to position yourself as one of those types of philosopher CEOs that's kind of the defining 
uh, uh, I guess, thought leader of the moment. And I think Carp's embracing that. Now, the question is, will that translate to sales? And I think eventually, you know, if the brand gets as big and people start taking AI as seriously, then it theoretically could, which is important. Okay. That's it for the weekly. Do we have anything else, Steve, Matt? No, I'm going to... I'm going to make a brain map kind of where I was going in the middle of the episode and, and try to understand if I have any forward predictions for what upcoming pieces might be out there. Coatstrap says Apollo is starting to get momentum. He commented a little bit on sales above. He said sales are, uh, he said he can't comment on sales, but he says we are aligned, meaning sales might be going a little bit better. Um, yeah, I mean, Q2. Q2 is going to determine a lot. Q2 is going to... So I disagree with Chris here. He says, Apollo is unique. AIP, not so much, but I might be wrong. I, you know, I originally thought that as well when AIP came out. The only reason I think that AIP is unique as well is because of what Dan Ives and what Bank of America is saying. I mean, their research teams have seemed to say that this is... And what are they saying so that people are... Well, they're saying that it's the it's one of the only platforms at a large scale to implement into an enterprise that can confidently secure your data and implement that. And I know that sounds really simple, but when you take a look under why Databricks bought Mosaic for 1.3 billion, like 1.3 billion just to be able to build some of the tooling infrastructure that Palantir has spent years building, it starts to seem not as basic of a moat. Uh, same thing with Snowflake acquiring Neva. They don't even have a generative AI application yet that they can offer to enterprises at scale, right? They're still developing their stuff in partnership with NVIDIA. It seems like it's a reasonable moat that they can build on top of um, to protect companies' data. Especially when you figure that the data does the LLMs don't matter unless the data is proprietary. And in order for the data to be proprietary, it has to be trained in something that's a secure environment. You factor in IL-6, all that stuff. So that's why I think AIP is unique. But I also think Q2, we're going to have to figure out, like, what is AIP adoption looking like? And Carp's going to have to answer those questions of if it's going well. See, I think this is where it gets tricky, right? Because it really was only rolled out in January, uh, June 1st. And so everyone's sitting here, you know, with one month left in Q2 thinking there's going to be all company? this massive growth and it's going to be massive customer growth the year over year. And it's like, you know, it literally was released less than two months ago. And I think everyone's putting their, their second foot step in front of their first and, and not letting the, the company, you know, walk before it can run. I think sure. people, and this is the problem that I have with everybody focusing on Q2 and we can get more into it next week as we, as we kind of wrap, wrap up for it. But Everyone's thinking that one month worth of, you know, excitement and, and customer growth is is going to blow everything out of the water. And I really think that they need to limit their expectations I mean, a little bit. Look, Matt's correct. For the simple fact, you look at cloud computing, not every organization has even moved to the cloud yet. There are organizations that are still on-prem. So adoption is not at the speed of light. Adoption is not overnight. And adoption takes time. And AIP was just rolled out companies haven't even begun to think about how they're going to implement AI. Very large scale, probably have, but a lot of companies aren't there yet. Like there's a huge roadmap and runway and you look at what Salesforce has done in growth. That's because it takes adoption for CRM. Even CRM, which is the backbone of a lot of things, take takes time to be adopted. So I, I agree. I agree with both of you guys. And I've been saying publicly on like a trillion streams I've done saying that I don't think Q2 is going to be that golden quarter. However, there is a valuation that is unsustainable if Q2 is not somewhat close to that golden quarter. And Carp put himself out there saying we're getting a shit ton of demand. That's why I think that's where it gets to the scary part where Q2 we have a massive tank. Look, because if if hold on, hold on. Let, me, let, me finish, let me finish. If if the demand is not there, because to Matt's point, it's hard to get it there in a month, right? Like totally reasonable. And that means the revenue growth is not there because the demand is not there or because the closing of the demand is not there. Um, and the valuation is still 40 billion. I don't know how we support that valuation that easily. If Q2 is not- miss, it's going to be very bad. Yes, it's going to be bad. That's, like, that's, this, this then is I go to Dan Ives being 25 right before earnings and I'm so conflicted, right? That's why- I brought it Look, up. it's a critical quarter. There's no question about that. If there's a mess and if the demand is not exciting, I don't even want to wake up the next day and see what happens. <laughs> but I, but I, I have a question though. Why why is it critical? Why is it a critical quarter? With one month, with one month to sign people. Evaluation because no, 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 I'm not talking about AIP. I'm just saying 
if they if they don't continue their sequence of growth in these categories, it puts their guidance for the year at jeopardy. We're going to be and that's what I'm tank. worried about. Like, and, and that's fine. I want to buy a dip, but we are will tank. Same, if same here. And look, it, it, depending on what happens, I'll probably be a buyer. But uh, from, from where we are right now, it's critical. Long term, maybe not. But for this point in time, it's a critical quarter. Long term, absolutely not. Unless there's some crazy thesis breaker or something yeah. that I do. Long term, Matt's 100% correct. But I'm like, that's why I kind of don't like that. We've I was kind of happy SoFi was dropping a little bit yesterday. It came back up because before earnings, you run up, you fuck up the numbers, you're gone, right? And I mean, I think when, when's AIP two? September. Okay. Which is kind of bullish because they have a second conference. So you kind of think, huh, maybe they did close some more customers, but we don't know. Yeah, but then you're going to be sitting around being like, oh, Q3 earnings, it's going to go to the moon. And it's like, well, they only had AIP2 uh, in September and they only had a month from that display. And I'm not worried about the stock going to the moon at all. I'm worried about customer count and revenue. Like, I don't give a fuck about the stock. I hope the stock doesn't, you know, I kind of hope the stock does tank. But my point is at this valuation, we need some metrics like customer count and revenue to be decent. And if they're not, we're tanking now that's great for long-term buyers but the point is you know if we're just speculating before earnings it's really confusing because then i put in dan ives report saying hey 25 before and i'm like this guy wants to say 25 and then no one in the planet wants to say the stock's going to 25 it doesn't matter what your time frame is no one cares everyone sees the headline and then a week later the stock's at 11. like no one wants to be that guy or that girl and so mm -hmm. that's the confusing part but to your point matt Q2's numbers are probably not going to be great because we can't expect for a month for them to sign up to shit when people are 95% of no. uh, companies no, are still no, on. I don't know that they need to sign people up from AIP. There's other ways to generate revenue. They can I don't know. I, th but it's, I think you and I understand that, Steve. Net dollar retention. I mean, upselling on other products. There's other ways to get to their guide. I'm worried about their 2023 guidance. I'm not worried about if they signed up customers from AIP or not. I'm worried about them continuing the commercial growth they can't slow down on that that is a big thing aip is going to come ai is in its infancy yep. and an aip con two and then eventually having more conferences to me is bullish because i would like to see this turn into a dreamforce type thing in the next five ten years yeah i agree yeah i, agree. I just hope that people understand 40 billion dollars for the company today is overvalued. I agree with that. Yeah, look, I 100% agree. We, we need revenue to go up and then maintain margins because if you take all everything else away from that, okay, take IP, take Foundry, take everything away from you. You just look at a straight dollar. If they keep growing and they maintain these margins, you get to 10 billion of revenue at some point at a 33 or just a 30% margin for free cash flow. Do the math. Like it's not hard to see how they can get these revenues. It's not hard to see how they can generate the free cash flow. They're already doing it. And then it's not hard to see what other companies are trading at and Palantir possibly trade at 100, 150 billion market cap. Agreed. If Pepsi Cola can trade at 45 times free cash flow. One Lambo. There's no reason to say that Palantir can't generate 5 billion free cash flow five to 10 years from now. Agreed. And then trade of 40 times, that's 200 billion mark cap. Coach Rep says, agreed, we're a couple of years out from AI adoption at scale, but without Foundry, you ain't going to get there. And that speaks to having your ontology. Yeah, and and, and the stuff. more people that sign up Foundry, the more people you have, they can implement AIP into their organization. Yeah. And that's more upsell. I'm not worried about AIP today. And to yeah, me, it's a good point. Yeah, I think a lot of, I know that you want to keep ending it uh, a minute because you probably have a date or something, but uh, the uh, I think without any sort of ontology in your organization, if you think you're just going to jump from having no sort of ontology, large language model or anything that organizes your data to immediately jumping to having AI or a, uh, an open AI sort of product, a BARD or an AIP come in and within days be up and running, you have another thing coming. And and that's part of the thing that I think was most seamless about UDOC and where we are in terms of, you know, we haven't adopted AIP yet, but I see how AIP could be adopted and implemented very quickly with guardrails, with 
with a lot of organizations that don't have any sort of large language models or ontology or anything like that, you can't even worry about the guardrails because you got to worry about getting your data in order. And that takes months, if not years, to be able to get it in an appropriate manner. Um, I guess it all depends on the complexities and, and how complex your organization is and, and how many different sort of categories you have for each individual and what's the what's the different levels of all the categorization and everything like that. But AIP is easy, in my opinion, to implement once you have that sort of organization, which we've been organizing ourselves that way since 2017, 2018 at UDOC. So it's it's not it seems like a natural progression. So 